Good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be here. My name is Dr. Lauren Barron. I'm one of the cardiothoracic surgeons at Texas Heart Institute in Baylor St. Luke's. One of the most common procedures that I perform is a coronary artery bypass graft. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what is the gold standard in women and should women be their own group? So let's start with why women might need their own group. Well, to start with, women present about 10 years later than men, and when they do present for coronary artery bypass grafting, they're sicker than men are, meaning they have more comorbid conditions, more diabetes, more hypertension, more renal disease. The time from the time when symptoms start until the time that women get diagnosed and treated is longer for women than it is for men, and the recommendations for treating almost all of what we have to say about coronary artery disease uh, surgically is based on studies that were performed mostly in men. Women are less likely to receive guideline-directed uh, therapy, and they're less likely to be able to be compliant with those therapies. They have a higher adjusted mortality risk for either form of revascularization, either surgical or percutaneous. And even though there's all these differences, men and women still derive the same survival benefits from revascularization. So it's harder for them to get a diagnosis, it's harder for them to get treatment. Uh, the treatment that they get is riskier, and yet when they get treatment, the appropriate treatment, they have the same outcomes as men. So let's go over a little bit what the anatomical difference between men and women are. And I mean with respect to their coronary arteries. Women have smaller coronary arteries than men. Most of the time we assume that arteries are gonna be based on the size of whatever it's feeding, meaning their height or their BMI or maybe just how big their heart is. But in truth, when you look at a CT imaging, researchers took men and women and did CT scans of their coronary arteries and what they found was that despite or even corrected for height, weight, BMI and how big or the left ventricular mass, that women have smaller coronary arteries than men on all three major coronary arteries and the left main. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because smaller coronary arteries are more likely to be occluded. So when you take a vessel and you connect it, you take a, a bypass vessel and connect it to a smaller coronary, that bypass vessel has a, um, a higher risk of occluding. It's also harder to sew a conduit or a vessel that you use to bypass to a smaller artery. So technically, sewing the same vessels are harder in women than they are in men. So let's talk about those conduits. That word conduit is just the word that we use for the vessel that is used to create the bypass. And we're gonna look at this through a lens of patency, meaning how does it stay open, survival of the patient, and what patient factors make what conduits a good choice or a bad choice. So let's talk about the conduits. And what we're gonna talk about is the first is the saphenous vein graft. And this is the old faithful. This is the one that we've used for decades and it works beautifully. The pros are that it's quick to get, it's easy to access, it's technically easier to get this particular conduit than any of the arterial conduits. And you can get a length of vein that rarely causes a problem, meaning you won't spend all of your conduit on one bypass if you need to do multiple bypass. The cons for this is really just patency. Uh, meaning how does it stay open? Because at five years, one fourth of these or 25% of these vessels won't be patent, they won't be working. Um, and at 10 years, up to 40% of these um, veins won't be patent. They're also not a great choice in people who don't have the veins. Either they have varicosities or they have end stage peripheral arterial disease and the healing will be an issue from the harvest site. The next um, is the gold standard, the left internal thoracic artery, LEDA, or also called the LEMA. This one is the gold standard. We know that this one has a survival benefit by five years and often earlier. I mean, at five years, 95% of these are still open and out to 10 years, 90% are still open. The cons for this particular graft are that it is uh, more technically challenging to get this graft ready to put onto the vessel than it is to do a vein. While most people will get this particular conduit, it's not a great option in patients who have subclavian stenosis um, or a narrowing that's before the takeoff of this vessel because the vessel itself becomes smaller. Um, so you can't even do a free graft well with these vessels. Um, multiple redo sternotomies mean that there's going to be scar tissue that's gonna impede the flow, um, oftentimes in these vessels where there's damage to the vessel. Previous radiation therapy, which is particularly salient to women, um, because obviously women have uh, a higher risk of breast cancer and a higher risk of having whole breast radiation. Um, and then a need for emergent or salvage procedures because like I said in, in the cons, it takes time to do this and sometimes um, the urgency of the need is, uh, outweighs the ability of us to get this particular conduit.
And so now we've talked about the left, let's talk about the right. Um, and it would make sense that the left and the right should be the same, but because of where the heart physically lies inside of the chest, which is slightly to the left of the sternum, um, it puts it in a very nice place for the left internal mammary to drop right down on top of it. But the right internal mammary has to cross under the sternum to be connected to any of those vessels. So the length is often a problem when you're talking about using the right internal thoracic artery. However, even though that's a problem, the patency, meaning how well it stays open, these are comparable. So besides the phys physical distance limiting um, what you can do with this artery, sometimes you can just take it off and use it as a free graft. And when you do that, the graph at the bottom is showing that the patency rate is the same. The other option is the radial artery. Now the pros for the radial artery is that it's quicker than doing um, bilateral internal thoracic arteries. There's no increase in the sternal wound infection because one of your internal thoracic arteries um, stays perfusing the sternum. The cons are that it's made differently, and we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy in a minute, but it's more prone to vasospasm. And patency, because it's uh, more muscular, requires a higher degree of obstruction before uh, the lesion. It's not ideal for everybody though. In patients with renal disease who may need their radial arteries for dialysis access, we tend to avoid using this. In patients who have uh, disease processes which lend towards calcium, if you're going to do this in a patient who's got severe peripheral arterial disease and you know that they calcify their vessels, it is, um, it's essential to get some sort of preoperative imaging before you make an incision, uh, otherwise you end up with an incision and no conduit. Um, there's also a hesitancy in patients who have a need for high acuity manual dexterity, such as people who use um, small micro movements, pianists, surgeons, um, other folks who use their hands for their livelihood, and then people who have heart failure who are likely going to need inotropes and pressors to go on and off pump. Uh, radial arteries aren't ideal for those people because, again, the, the muscular wall means that you're going to have a significant amount of vasospasm. So what does the data say about using two arterial grafts when you have to bypass more than one lesion? Because in general, most people who get coronary artery bypass grafting have multiple lesions. And so we're going to use one artery from the chest wall, and then what's the next one? Well, in observational studies, and this is a study looking at tw about 21,000 people using the radial artery compared to saphenous vein, it shows that radial artery grafts uh, confer a survival advantage. When we look at the same type of study, an observational study, the bilateral internal thoracic mammary as the second conduit rather than a vein, they also have a survival um, advantage. So why can't we just conclude that we should be doing that? Well, the truth is that these are observational studies. And in observational studies, um, a second arterial graft confers a survival benefit. But for some reason, the patients who got saphenous vein were selected not to get um, a second arterial graft, and we don't know why. Those reasons aren't documented. And it could be that they, the patient had some condition which the surgeon felt like they wouldn't be able to tolerate um, the amount of work it would take in order to get a second radial artery, but those decisions aren't documented, so it's hard for us um, to understand how the bias affects the results. In order to do that, we have uh, randomized controlled trials where everyone is assigned a group and then whatever group they're assigned uh, is what they receive. And when we looked at the ART trial, which is the first randomized controlled trial, we didn't see a difference. That top graph shows no difference between um, single arterial graft and multiple arterial grafts. The problem was that in this study, um, and you can see that we, I say that all of, all of the randomized controlled trials to date have significant methodological issues or are underpowered. Part of the issues with the ART trial is that there was a large crossover and so it was hard for us to draw conclusions given that the people who were assigned to receive single or multiple arterial grafts actually didn't receive the treatment um, that they were supposed to receive. And when we go and we look at these patients um, on an as-treated um, analysis, which is basically taking a randomized controlled trial and, and treating it like an observational study after the fact, again, we see that there's an advantage. But again, we can't account for the bias. So let's move on from uh, where we currently are with the data because at present there are no results from uh, randomized controlled trials. And let's talk about with what we know, why do surgeons select what they select for the patients that they have? So we'll talk about some patient factors, some lesion characteristics, the patient's age, their comorbid conditions, how risky is their operation, and should gender be a part of this decision?
Well, when we look at the conduits, and this is where I told you we would talk a little bit about the anatomy, the radial artery has a thick band of muscle and one single layer of this stretchy internal elastic lamina, whereas the internal mammary artery has a discontinuous layer of muscle with internal elastic lamina interspersed. So you can see why the radial artery being more muscular and more continuous, when it spasms down, it shrinks down the lumen. Knowing that, there are some factors that make a radial artery not ideal, and those are peripheral vascular disease, like we talked about, smoking, advanced age, and diabetes. When you look at the internal thoracic arteries, only advanced age and smoking affect these arteries. When we look at lesion anatomy, there are two things that we look at. Number one, the location of the lesion, and we talked a bit about this with how far you have to go, or distance, when we talked about the right internal thoracic artery. The second is the degree of stenosis, and we're gonna talk about something, um, when we talk about it from an angiographic standpoint, we talk about it in FFR or IFR, meaning what is the flow beyond the lesion. When we talk about it from a surgical standpoint, we talk about competitive flow. So when you look at the, the graph, or the, I'm sorry, the angiograph on the left, you can see that there's a blue arrow in the middle. That blue arrow in the middle is showing you the magnitude of flow. In the next picture, you see that the lesion is much more severe, and in the picture, you can see that there's some plaques, and the flow that's beyond the lesions is a lot less. The magnitude of the blood that's getting through is a lot less. So what we know is that any arterial conduit's gonna function better if the FFR is less than 0.78. And we know that in patients who get a radial artery, if the blockage is 90% that you're bypassing, it will approach the same as a lemma. So let's talk about competitive flow. You can see that in the picture on the left, um, there is a blue arrow that's showing the native flow. And you can see that it's flowing uh, strong and that the green flow that's coming down, half of it is reflected back, meaning that the flow that's coming down the new conduit isn't moving through and so there's stasis and those graphs are more likely to go down. When there's a blockage and the native flow shrinks down like in the second picture, more flow flows through the new conduit and into the heart, keeping the vessel open. The next factor we're going to talk about is age. Um, and when we talk about age, when we look at propensity matched pairs, there's 800 propensity matched pairs looking at um, a right um, looking at a radial artery versus a saphenous vein as the second conduit, and we don't see a mortality benefit in age greater than 70. So in patients older than 70, perhaps we shouldn't be doing multiple arterial grafts, except 80% of this population in this study was male, and we know that women present a decade later. So does this really apply to women? In the next, we're gonna look at risk and the risk profile. And we know that high-risk patients do not benefit from multiple arterial grafting. And this particular study is interesting because if you look at the top two graphs and the bottom two graphs, that's low risk at the top showing a benefit and high risk at the bottom showing no benefit. This particular group, um, although this is an observational study, split it into gender and found that gender didn't make a difference for this particular group. So even um, in the high-risk patients in men and women, don't benefit from multiple arterial grafting, but both men and women um, benefited from multiple arterial grafting in low-risk patients. However, if you look at um, the mortality risk and you look at the threshold for which there was a difference, you can see that the groups actually had to be stratified differently because this group realized that men and women and risk factors aren't the same. So what about gender? So conduits in women are smaller and more reactive. The target coronaries in women are smaller with less flow, which makes them technically harder. And in a cohort study, it shows that men and women both benefit from multiple arterial grafts, but the threshold for which these two groups should be stratified are different. So what do you mean we still don't know about women? We have all this data. Well, what would we actually need? We would need to see 25% less women who have had two arterial grafts compared to those with one arterial graft and one vein graft experience any of these things, death, stroke, MI not related to the surgery, repeat revascularization, or hospital readmission for ACS or heart failure. In order for us to have a clinically important outcome, we'd have to see this. And a clinically important outcome would be a 25% risk reduction, which would arguably change the standard practice for women. So, what are the current recommendations and where did this data come from? Now, the current recommendations for coronary artery bypass grafting are unquestionably contested between um, 
the different surgical societies and um, around the world. However, these are the most recent ones and I wanted to show you what the data is based on. When we look at the data for radial arteries that's in the top um, the top box, you can see that it was a meta-analysis of six randomized controlled trials with about 300 female subjects, roughly 15 to 20 percent. The next one is about um, IMA or the internal mammary artery and that's a registry study. Uh, most of these studies were performed in the 60s and this is 951 female patients, observational, but also about 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent. Um, a randomized controlled trial looking at the IMA compared to the saphenous vein, again 446 uh, patients and again between 15 and 25 percent. These are the current recommendations from uh, the European societies and from the surgical societies in the U.S. So what would actually be required? Well this is the first randomized control, well, this is the, the second, the current randomized control trial looking at multiple arterial grafting. And they found, and they have 4,300 subjects that are enrolled, they just finished their enrollment, they have 25 international centers, and they also only have 15 to 18 percent of female subjects. But these authors actually looked at whether or not they would be powered to have an answer for women and what they found was there's just not enough female subjects to know what is statistically better for women. So now they've started the Roma Women's Trial which our center will be enrolling uh, in the next few months. This is going to have 2,000 additional female patients um, in order for us to find some solid conclusions on what is actually better for women. So what do we know? Well, we know that left internal mammary arteries, lemas or letas, have a mortality benefit for both men and women. We know that the standard of care is to have the left internal mammary artery used when it can be used. We know that female patients need advocates from their healthcare teams for diagnosis, treatment, and compliance. We know that comorbid conditions are likely to factor into conduit decisions and that when women present, they're more likely to have these comorbid conditions. And so a heart team approach for treating women is the best. We know that women's anatomy is smaller and more reactive and it lends towards a more technically complex operation. So really, we don't know which conduits are best for women yet. So while we don't know exactly what we should be doing with women quite yet, what we do know is that a heart team approach is the best bet.